Good morning. Good morning, good morning. Hi. Happy New Year's Eve. How are you doing? Good. Wow, really? Good. You made it. Guys, you got through Christmas. Now the tree's looking a little, if you got a live tree. Uh, my name is Gina Stockton, if I don't know you. I'm one of the pastors here. I get to be a part of the teaching team. And I'm just excited to be with you this morning and to, for all of us to look with anticipation what God has for us as a community. Like Brandon said, we've been praying and we've been asking him and we've been seeking him and um, wanting to hear his voice for us as a community in 2024. And so next week we're starting a new series. And as I was praying for this morning and what the Lord would have for us, there's two things that kept coming up. And the first one was, it's time. It's time. And the second is that this is a new chapter. There is a page that is turning. Today is New Year's Eve, and we're on the edge of a new year, but it's more than just a new year. It's a new chapter. It's a new chapter in history, (laughs) in the world right now. Things have been shifting. It's a new chapter in the global church, the bride of Christ, the body of believers all over. It's a new chapter for Mountain View, and it's a new chapter for many of us in this room, a new season, and it's all interconnected. All of it, what God's doing in your life, what God's doing in the life of his church, what God's doing in the world, it's all interconnected because there's a story being written of God's extravagant love for his creation. There's a story being written of his love for humanity, his love for you. (laughs) And each chapter builds on the one before and prepares us for the next. And I feel this sense of urgency that it's time. It's time. It's time for the page to turn. Oh, (laughs) literally, the page to turn. Um, Would you pray with me as we dive in? Father, God, I thank you for your presence. You are here, you are in our midst. Lord, I thank you that you are faithful, that you are kind, like Mark shared, that in the highs and the lows of life, in the good and the hard and everything in between, you are present, you never fail. And so Lord, as we stand here at the edge of something new, Lord, would you give us eyes to see you? Would you give us ears to hear you this morning? I just take authority over anything that opposes you, anything that would come against your agenda here this morning. Would you silence distraction right now, we ask in Jesus' name. We want to hear you. We want to see you. So, Lord, Holy Spirit, come, speak now, we ask in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. So with Christmas, we came to the end of Advent, and this is a season, this time of anticipation and expectation of Jesus' birth, and Brandon um, shared with us how there was this long waiting that humanity had experienced from the last time God spoke at the end of the Old Testament through the prophets to the birth of Jesus. There was 400 years of silence, and that 400 years was broken by the cry of a baby, And um, suddenly there was this new chapter, this new beginning in the story of humanity and God's plan to redeem us. It was time. It was time for Jesus to come. And in all the flurry of angels speaking and the crazy trust of Joseph and Mary and uh, prophecies being fulfilled and magi bringing gifts and worshiping, Mary and Joseph and this baby are human. They're vulnerable, they're dependent, they begin this long journey of preparation. Jesus, you know, they, they, um, there's a threat on Jesus' life, they move to Egypt, they come back after the death of Herod, and they start to just live, and they grow a family, and Jesus now becomes an older sibling with brothers and sisters, and he starts to uh, learn his father's trade. Uh, His dad was a carpenter, so he's kind of an apprentice to his father in ancient ancient Jesus culture. (laughs) Not that. Ancient Jewish culture. Um, The 
man, the husband, the father, the patriarch of the family provided for, cared for, and protected his family. And as the eldest son, um, it would be the oldest son's job to learn that, to step into that, to grow into that. So Jesus was preparing to be that. Eventually his father did pass away and he did have to step into that role. But as he's apprenticing to his earthly father, he's also growing under the tutelage of his heavenly father. He's in a way apprenticing to God the Father. And we see that a little bit, a little glimpse of that in Luke when um, his parents lose him at the Passover and they can't figure out where he's at and they're searching for him and they find him in the temple with the rabbis and he's listening and he's asking questions. And when they come to him, they're like, where have you been? And he says, why are you freaked out? Wouldn't you know I'd be with my father, in my father's house about his business? Already as a child, he was learning, he was growing, he was apprenticing. There's these 30 years of life, of experiences, of joy and pain and everything in between. 30 years of preparation, 30 years of waiting, hidden years, and then it was time. It was time for his baptism, the beginning of his revealing, the beginning of his ministry, three years of calling people, building relationship, preaching about God's kingdom, inviting people into and demonstrating what he had already been living in his day-to-day -day life. Dependence, love, intimacy with God. And through those three years, there were countless healings, miracles, teachings, conversations, challenging the religious leaders, discipling, and then it was time. It was time for a brutal chapter, a time for his trial, his torture, his death, his burial. After his burial, his disciples were scattered, they were confused, they were in despair, they didn't understand what had just happened. And after three days, it was time. It was time for his resurrection, which by the way, nobody saw coming. <laughs> <laughs> and he appeared to his followers, starting with the women, then the rest, having intimate conversations, walking with them, cooking for them, caring for them, caring for his friends, bringing healing, bringing hope and encouragement and the promise of the coming Holy Spirit. And then it was time, time for him to leave, time for his ascension, and at this point, the disciples were waiting. They were praying. All of their assumptions, all of their presumptions had gone up in smoke. They finally surrendered it all. They're dependent. They're surrendered. They're waiting. They're prepared. And I would argue that they probably had no idea they were prepared, let alone what they were prepared for. But now it was time. It was time for the Holy Spirit to come, for the church to be ignited, for the gospel to go out into the world. And I love this moment in Acts 2, verse 1, when it says, that when the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all gathered in one place, and suddenly there was from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And in that moment, they were filled with the Holy Spirit. I'm going to get emotional. <laughs> No, Gina. Uh, they were filled with the Holy Spirit and they started to speak other languages. And they're in Jerusalem and there's people from all ends of the earth, all cultures and countries, and they all hear the gospel for the first time in their own language. And they're, they're awestruck. And 3,000 people come to Jesus in that moment. And this wasn't a moment that uh, was strategically planned, there was no program, there was no grand organization that was orchestrating everything, there was no marketing campaign, there was no Instagram or internet. It was just Jesus followers, gathered, surrendered, dependent, waiting. That's it. And suddenly, as I was praying and reading and Praying and reading. <laughs> it's so interesting because I think suddenlies are often a long time in the making. And it's time. We're at the beginning of a new chapter. It's time. 
Are we ready for the sudden leaf? You know, the last couple of chapters um, of the church in the world, particularly in Western evangelical church, the last few chapters have been pretty crazy. <laughs> in the you know, early 1900s up to like 1970, there were several like moves of the spirit, things that happened. The last big one was probably the Jesus movement. Um, I was a product of that. Maybe a lot of you in here were too. And these amazing moves of God ignited um, the gospel being spread and churches being planted and some amazing things. Millions of people came to Jesus and the mega churches were formed and worship music went from being hymns and little choruses to being a genre and to being an industry. And then with the internet, the gospel now is branded and packaged and distributed and has become like this mega industry, probably a multi-billion dollar industry, right? And there's some amazing, beautiful miraculous things that have happened and some pretty gnarly things at the same time, right? Why? Because just like God's people throughout history, through the Old and New Testament, we just, we do, we get some things right and we get some things wrong. And this last chapter, I remember New Year's Eve of 2019 on the verge of 2020, and it was like, 2020, yeah, it's going to work, 2020 vision, you know, like, all this stuff, like, so much excitement, anticipation, and man, there was a suddenly nobody expected. Global pandemic shuts down the world. We weren't ready for it, and the church, we were exposed God exposed the areas where we have placed our dependence that weren't him. The following political upheaval, social unrest, the death of George Floyd, and all of that that brought the church, we find a church, and I'm not talking about Mountain View, I'm just talking about the global church. I'm just talking about believers, what the church should be, was, could be. We find a church that instead of being a place of hope and healing, rapidly became a place of division, judgment, and fear. And instead of being a trustworthy place of integrity, for many, they saw the fall of prominent leaders and organizations. There was abuse and hurt uncovered and rampant deconstruction of faith. It's a little bit of a reckoning, I would say. But I believe it's God's kindness that shines a light and exposes things. Just like that, we found ourselves in a post-Christian world. And here is a a local church, Mountain View, weathered all of that, and it was hard, and people left, and struggling with leadership, and how do you lead when you can't gather, and all of the things, and then finally everything settles, and then we have a pastor and a worship pastor that move on, God calls them out, and then we've been in two years of transition and a pastor surge and a new pastor comes and budget challenges and layoffs and all the things but all of these chapters have had beautiful powerful amazing gifts even in the hard there's preparation there's a readying and it's time it's time to hear the invitation that Jesus has for us as his people So we're going to, for the rest of our time, sit in Ephesians. If you have your Bible, you're welcome to turn there. We're going to kind of skip through it. Um, This is one of my favorite books. I love the book of Ephesians. If you haven't spent time in there, I urge you to. It's rich. It's deep. It's a letter from Paul. Um, Most say to the church of Ephesus, but a lot of theologians believe that this letter was actually written as a circular letter, meaning that it was meant for more of the global church, not necessarily specifically to the church at Ephesus. Maybe it started there, but it was meant to make its way around to the other churches, and largely because it doesn't address any specific problems. It's more of a a call to maturity. It's Paul calling the people of God to own their identity, who they are, and their authority in Jesus. It's also a book of intercession. 
Uh, such a significant part of Paul's ministry is prayer and intercession. I think it's so overlooked. He is an intercessor, and he's constantly calling people to pray, and this book is no different. Um, this book was written in 62 AD, three decades after Pentecost. And I, I love getting that context because I think we look at the New Testament and think it just goes like this, but you figure this, this holy, suddenly moment in Acts where radical things are happening, and three decades later, the church finds itself trying to get along, trying to figure out how to be Christ followers in a world that isn't following Jesus. They are trying to figure out how to live in unity. They're struggling with um, outside influences. They're struggling with mixing their faith with other faiths, and all these things as you go through all of Paul's letters. And this letter is... Um, is Paul's call up. It's his, hey guys, it's time. <laughs> it's time. And I love, uh, one commentary describes this letter as being to a group of believers who are rich beyond measure in Jesus, but living like beggars because they're ignorant of their wealth. Like they have the knowledge, they know who Jesus is, they've accepted him, but they're not walking it, they're not living it, they're not owning it. And so this is Paul's manifesto his call um, to the people of God. So I'm just going to do a quick overview. In chapters 1 and 2, he starts, he just out of the gate, blessed is God our Father who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing, chosen us, adopted us, accepted us, redeemed us, forgiven us. We've been given wisdom, an inheritance, the seal of the Holy Spirit, We've been given grace. We've been given citizenship. We were dead in our sins. Now we're alive in Christ. You are his workmanship, his masterpiece. And as a group of believers, we're now united in Christ. There was a lot of division. Gentile believers, that means people who weren't Jewish and Jewish believers not getting along. He's like, no, 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 no. Now you're united in Christ. And Ephesians 2, verse 22, uh, the end of the verse says, you're also being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. You are all these things. Christ has redeemed you. He loves you. He's accepted you. He's forgiven you. You are united, and you are being built. Not Mountain View, we, you, this room, we are being built together into a dwelling place for God. And in chapter 3, Paul dives into the mystery of that and the mystery of the church and the mystery of this. And then in 14, here goes his intercession. This is his second prayer in the letter. Um, in verse 14, he says, For this reason I bow my knees to the Father in heaven under whose we've all been named, right? This emphatic, this, this passionate prayer. And in verse 17, he says, I pray that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with the fullness of God. That word comprehend, I, it gets frustrating sometimes because the English word just doesn't cut it. When you think of comprehend, what do you think of? Like understanding, right? Like I understand. Oh, I understand. Right? It's intellectual. It's knowledge. But the word comprehend actually uh, tr is translated to seize, to take possession of and to own as mine. Paul is saying, I pray that you would possess and own as yours the height, the length, the depth of God's love for you, your identity, your authority, all of it. It's time for you to own it, for you to live it, for it to be in your bones. Why? Verse 19, that you would be filled with all of the fullness of God. Not just head knowledge, not just memorized, not just going through the motions, but that you would be filled, that you would comprehend it, that it would be in you, that you would be breathing it so that you'd be filled with the fullness of God. 
And that fullness is not just for you. Chapter 4, he goes into the mystery of the church. The unity in the body, body and the necessity of the diversity of gifts and people in the body of Christ. He says there's one body of believers. There's one Holy Spirit. There is one baptism and there is one Lord. And it's time, Mountain View, for this community, for the world, for your family, for your friends, for your neighbors, for your coworkers, to experience all of the fullness of God working in and through you. Chapter five, Paul says in verse one, therefore be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us as a fragrant offering, a sacrifice to God. Be imitators of God as beloved children. I love Paul's intentionality with his language. He doesn't stop it with be imitators of God. He says, be imitators of God as beloved children. I think it's so easy for us. We are, we are a people who are just like, just tell me what to do, and I'll do it. Like, what do I do? Do I stand here? I'll stand here. Great. Okay, you want me to kneel? I'll kneel. Okay, great. You want me to, you want me to, you want me to say this to how many people? Okay, got it. No, 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 no. He's saying, be imitators of God as beloved children. That word beloved is dear. It's worthy of love. It's favorite. There's delight in it. I had this picture as I'm reading this of like a toddler. If you've had kids, have grandkids, have, an, have been an aunt or an uncle, or you've been a child, <laughs> you know, like little ones, and they get, they get it in them that they want to be like mom or dad. They go put on mom or dad's shoes, their teeny tiny little feet and the big floppy shoes, and they put on like a, a purse or a hat or a shirt, and they're like, you know, scraping through the, you know, right? They're, and they're squealing with delight. And as a parent, you're just like, it's, it, there's so much love and so much grace. Or a, a five-year-old who so wants to help build the Ikea furniture or help with the chocolate chip cookies, right? And you bring them in, and it's a love of a parent that brings them in, not like, I really need the help, and they're going to really make this go quicker. No. <laughs> right? No, it's love, it's relationship, there's so much grace, there's no expectation of perfection, but an invitation into intimacy and knowing. Be like little children, imitate him. It's time. It's time. Verse 14 of Ephesians 5. Actually, the verse is that precede that, I'm not going to go into them. He's calling people out of compromise. He's calling them to stop having one foot over here and one foot over here, but to come. It's time. And he says, awake, O sleeper, arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Wake up. Wake up. And I don't think it's a scolding. Doesn't mean it's without authority. It's a difference. It's wake up. Come out of hiding. Come out of hibernation. Maybe the spirit in you has been shut down. Maybe the last year, five years, 10 years, it's been hard. Maybe things have shut down. It's time to wake up. Maybe there's parts of you that have been hiding. Maybe you are part of the collateral damage of church gone wrong and there's hurt. It's time. It's time for healing. It's time to come out of dormancy, out of hibernation, it's time to stop staying at a safe distance and come close. You know, in um, the winter, 
not in Southern California, we don't really have a winter, but in an actual winter, I've heard tales. <laughs> I'm born and raised in San Diego, so it's like, a, it's like Narnia to me, but actually, in places where there's an actual winter, trees and plants, all of their energy, they all move inward and it goes down deep into the roots. Their cellular activity slows and they go down for protection and safety. And at some point, the sun comes out and the soil begins to warm and it's time to wake up. It's time to come out from beneath and move and grow. It's time. The next chapter in New Season in Mountain View, it's not about Brandon or the staff or you. <laughs> or all of us and our preferences and our presumptions or our opinions. It's about Jesus and his church. It's about his people in this place being everything he's called us to be. This next chapter in the global church is not about who gets elected in 2024. It's not about figuring out who's cornered the market on God's will. It's not about your favorite platformed ministry or preacher or whoever you listen to religiously, podcasts or whatever. It's about the relentless love of God and the redemption and reconciliation of humanity that Jesus paid for. <laughs> it's about his presence. It's about his kingdom. It's about his people like they were at Pentecost, gathered, surrendered, dependent, waiting, ready. And make no mistake, it's about a holy God who is not to be trifled with. He's a holy God who is not threatened by, fearful of, or dictated to by my plans. <laughs> my faith or lack thereof, by the state of the world, the political climate, or the state of the organizational church. He's just not. He's God. I'm not. You're not. Brandon's not. Marty's not. Whoever you will follow on Instagram is not. He is. And if we're going to step into this new chapter, it's time. And please hear this as an invitation. This is not a religious call to arms in action. It's not. It's an invitation to our knees. It's an invitation to communion with the one who knows you and sees you and loves you. So it's time for Jesus to be Lord. For Jesus to be Lord. Like actually. <laughs> Not just saying it, but it's surrender to his lordship in our lives. And that's a day-to-day -day thing sometimes. Sometimes it's a moment-to-moment -moment thing. I got to tell you, I'm... I'm frequently having to go, dang it, I pushed you off again. Lord, forgive me. You're Lord. I'm not. It's time for him to be Lord because he's good. Because he is the king of kings. He is the Lord of lords. He is the alpha, the omega, the beginning and the end. And he's the lover of your soul. It's time to become like him. That's what discipleship is. Our next 2024, we're like spiritual formation, Christ formation. The goal is for us to be transformed into him, his image, but to become like him, we must know him. Not just know about him. We need to be present with his presence. I've said this before. Um, in the past when I've taught, but, you know, my husband, Norm, is a musician. He's pretty well-known in certain areas, and 
Um, there's a lot of people who know a lot about my husband. You can Google Norm Stockton and you'll find out all sorts of things. You'll find out that he was born in Japan, that he learned bass by taking uh, the high strings off of a guitar. Um, you'll learn that his favorite bass player and his inspiration was Paul McCartney, like all the things. But I'm his wife and I know him intimately. I know him in a way that we can go to a restaurant and I know what he's going to order before he orders it. I know when he walks into a room if he's hurting or if he's upset or if he's um, in a good mood. I know him because I've been with him. I've spent time with him. If we want to become like Jesus, we need to know him. And like Paul is urging, we need to take possession of and own our identity, who we are, because all the fullness of God won't be able to be in us and work through us if we don't trust and believe and own with every fiber of our being who he says we are and who he is. And none of this is possible without the power of the Holy Spirit. You can't do enough, learn enough, mind your P's and Q's enough to just magically make this happen. We're dependent, like the church before Pentecost, waiting and praying, we're dependent on the power of the Holy Spirit to move in and through us. And you know what's really interesting? Um, supernatural, we talk about supernatural, the supernatural love of God, or the supernatural spiritual gifts or whatever. In the kingdom, it's just natural nothing super about it. It's just, yeah, duh. <laughs> we tend to sensationalize or try to conjure up or try to make something, but you know what? When we're walking in him, with him, that close, it's just normal. You're going to pray for your neighbor, she will come to Jesus. You might pray for your neighbor, she gets healed from something. Prayer class little shameless plug if you come to prayer class we talk about this we go deep in this what is biblical normal what does it look like to step into all that God has called us to to exercise the gifts that we've been given you've all been given spiritual gifts but we can't step into any of that without the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives there's a lot of darkness in the world <laughs> Uh, Christmas Eve, Brandon uh, read Isaiah 9-2. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of deep darkness, on them a light has shined, right? Jesus came. He was that light. Paul in Ephesians 5-8 says, For at one time you were in darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. So walk as children of the light. It's time. It's time. So we're going to do um, things a little bit differently. I want to invite the band back up wherever they're at. But before we do communion, I know we typically just do communion and song, and I know some of you leave right after communion, and that's fine. But this morning, I just want to pause. We're going to sing one song together before we do communion. And I don't know where you're at this morning. The Lord does. You see, for the church, for his bride to be ready, for his bride to be light, starts with me. Starts with you. It's time to not sit back and be an audience. And again, I'm, it's not a call to arms. It's an invitation to intimacy. It's an invitation to dependence. It's an invitation to wake up. It's an invitation to healing. It's an invitation to hope. It's an invitation to let go of maybe offense and hurt. Receive the healing that the Lord has. Maybe some of you in here feel like you're in a stage of life where it's like, you know what? I don't know that I have anything to offer. 
I did at one point. Now, I don't know. I'm weary. It's time. It's a new season. God is not done with you. He sees you. My family, um, I'll just share really quick. It's just We've had a rough season. It's been a long chapter. It's been a decade. Starting with my youngest battling depression and anxiety so severe that she ended up in the hospital twice. The last five years, my dad's rapid decline with Alzheimer's and my stepmom, the complexity of that relationship, her losing her eyesight, her death. The last two years, my eldest daughter having a surgery that went horribly wrong and subsequent surgeries and subsequent trauma, depression, anxiety, PTSD, perils, I mean, you name it. It's been brutal. And the holidays for the last several years have been hard, just like stumble to Thanksgiving, we don't have family nearby, and it's like, okay, I think the last four Thanksgivings, my husband ordered food from Urban Plates, and we just like limped to the table, ate, and we all went, you know, <laughs> collapsed on the couch and watched a movie. And this year, I was just like, you know what? No, not this year. It's time. Over the years, our family had kind of cocooned and gone inward. Our, my home used to be a home. I used to host people all the time. Like, I'm a people person. I'm, you know, all the things. And we just had come in this way. And I'm like, you know what? It's time. It's time to let people close again in. It's time. So I invited Kaimana and Colin and their four kids. So suddenly, I went from four of us to ten. Like, whoa, ten people are going to be in my house. Then my niece came and her boyfriend and my daughter's boyfriend. We had 13 people in my house, and it was chaos. And I overcooked the turkey because the oven doesn't work well. And, you know, all the things. But it was powerful, and it was beautiful, and it was time. And it doesn't mean that with Thanksgiving everything was solved, but it was the beginning of the soil warming so that we're ready for the suddenly and the suddenly happened just in the last two weeks, like things are shifting. There is hope. God is moving. He is not done with you. So as we sing this song, I just want you to sit with him. Ask him. It's time. What's it time for? There might be a chapter in your life that's closing and one that's starting. What does that look like? Maybe it's just the year shifting. Where, like, like Mark had said, where was God faithful this last year? And how can the highs and the lows and everything in between be preparing you for what's coming? Because nothing is wasted with him, ever. Let's pray. Father, um, it's time. Holy Spirit, come. Would you speak to your kids, your sons, and your daughters in this place? And maybe you walked in here this Sunday, you came last week, and you don't even know, like, this whole Jesus thing. You're like, what? <laughs> so, Lord, in Jesus' name, I, I just pray that, that those in the room that don't know you they would encounter you. There is a God who in Psalm 139 says that he knit you together in your mother's womb. You were made on purpose. That he delighted in you. And God so loved you that he sent Jesus that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. He loves you. So my hope for you in this time is that you would receive and hear and know the presence of God.